Hey, welcome back! Today we are looking at the Iliad, and we are looking at the great climax in Book 22. But before we get to the climactic action, let's look at the characters of this book. Of course this book is going to feature Hector and Achilles, and the final moment where the two of them face off. It's the moment we've been waiting for. And both of them really get to shine in this book. Achilles, of course, is all rage, and he's finally getting to face off with the man who killed his best friend, the man who he is definitely out to destroy in all of his anger. And as we've seen in the last two books, Achilles is all ruthlessness. He's still at a white-hot rage from the death of Patroclus. Hector also reflects his entire character in this one moment. We've seen him as a character who has great nobility, who has a great connection to his family. We've also seen him as a character who can be prideful, who can be overconfident. And this book really gives us a fully developed Hector. Aside from these two characters, we're going to get some of the gods. We're going to see Zeus as he finally comes to the moment he's been building towards. How does Zeus deal with the death of Hector? He is, after all, the, the king of the gods who's put all of this into play. But he has a moment where he's not 100% sure he wants to sacrifice Hector, and that is interesting. We also see Athena at the moment that she gets what she wants, which is to support Achilles in his fight against Hector. And after all the time that there was cheating going on on the other side, where the gods helped Hector out left and right, would heal him if he got injured, would rescue him if he got in trouble, would drop characters in his laps to kill, Athena's cheating for Achilles is sort of just fair play, I guess. We also have a few other human characters. We have Priam and Hecuba, the parents of Hector. And we get to see their grief and despair as they watch their son go out to his death. There's also a great grief sequence from Andromache, Hector's wife. Okay, now let's look at the action. We pick up exactly where the last book left off. Achilles is chasing after Apollo, who he thinks is Agenor. All of the Trojans are rushing inside of the gates, and as the book begins, they're all panting and breathing hard because they've just gotten into safety. Now that all of his Trojans are safe, Apollo turns around and faces Achilles and says, Ha ha, what you doing? You're chasing after a god. You can't hurt me. And Achilles is infuriated because Apollo tricked him and took away his opportunity to kill a whole bunch more Trojans. But there's really nothing that Achilles can do against Apollo, other than curse at him a little bit and then turn around and head back into the fighting. However, at this point, we discover that Hector did not go into the city with all the rest of the Trojans. He stayed outside the gate by himself. And there he is, standing in front of the gate, ready to face off with Achilles. Now, why would he do a stupid thing like that? And up on the wall, we see old King Priam, who looks down and he sees his son standing in front of the city. And we have this speech from Priam. Priam calls out to his son and begs him to come inside. Don't fight Achilles. He will kill you. Get inside. And the plea involves this contrast between the way young men and the way old men view war. Throughout this book, we've seen person after person slaughtered on the field. And as all these characters died, as I've mentioned several times, we got a glimpse into their lives, the way their death would impact their families, their homes, and all the people around them. The grief and the loss from all of that. Here again, Priam reiterates that idea and says, yeah, you young men out there, it may seem glorious to you to throw yourselves out there and die, but as an old man, he sees things from a different perspective. And he knows with the death of Hector will come ultimately the doom of Troy. He's going to watch his most beloved son die down there, and then he and all the rest of the city will ultimately be killed as well. In this, he grieves for all of his sons. He notices that two of them didn't come back in with the rest of the army, and he hopes that they're just captured, but he is fairly sure they're dead. They are Politerus and Lyacon, who we saw killed in Book 20 and 21. Just as Priam finishes his passionate plea for Hector to come inside, Hecuba stands up and also pleads with him. She pleads from the perspective of a mother. She nurtured him and gave him life as a child. And now she begs him to respect that and to respect her role as a mother and not throw away that life that she brought into the world and nurtured. 
And yet both of their pleas from the top of the wall fall on deaf ears, because Hector is thinking about how he's going to face Achilles. And as he watches Achilles tear across the field towards him, he's having all of this inner turmoil, like some of the other characters we've seen earlier. And it describes him as a snake hiding in his hole ready to pounce out at someone. But also it describes his heart as he's struggling with how to face Achilles. We see that Hector does not want to go back inside, because of his shame and guilt. He refused to listen to Polydamus, and he had all of them camp out there, over there by the ships, and he wound up getting half of his army killed. He can't bring himself to strut into the city in safety and have everyone mock him for the deaths that he caused through his poor planning. And so he has to throw himself out against Achilles. For a moment, his mind flits to the idea of trying to negotiate with Achilles. Maybe he could set down all of his armor and weapons and like, you know, walk over there and be like, hey buddy, let's talk about things. We will give you Helen, we will give you all of the treasure that we stole from you. We will even give you all the treasure in the whole city. You can ransack us, just let us live. But he knows that Achilles is not going to listen. Achilles is white hot with rage and he will just slaughter Hector before he can get three words out. So that plan will not work. Finally, Hector sees no way but to face Achilles head on. There's nothing else for him to do. He can't bear the shame of going back inside the city, and he knows that Achilles will not listen to anything he has to say. And just as Achilles gets close, Hector suddenly breaks. He can't take the pressure anymore, and he turns and he runs. Hector looked up, saw him, started to tremble. Nerve gone, he could hold his ground no longer. He left the gates behind him, and away he fled in fear, and Achilles went for him, fast, sure of his speed as a wild mountain hawk, the quickest thing on wings, launching smoothly, swooping down on a cringing dove, and the dove flits out from under, and the hawk screaming over the quarry, plunging over and over, his fury driving him down to beak and tear his kill, so Achilles flew at him breakneck on in fury, with Hector fleeing along the walls of Troy as fast as his legs would go. And it describes this intense running scene, where Hector runs around the entire city with Achilles close behind, and they make actually three laps of the city. Each time they do, Hector tries to bear close to the gates, hoping that he'll get some assistance as people will shoot down or throw spears down at Achilles. But each time he tries to lean in towards the gates, Achilles cuts him off and runs him back out into the field. And just as they get the third time around and begin their fourth run, Zeus looks down and he pauses for a moment. Because here we've come to the climax, we know how this battle is supposed to end, but Zeus isn't really sure he wants to end it that way. Unbearable. The man I love, hunted round his own city walls and right before my eyes, my heart grieves for Hector. Hector, who burned so many oxen in my honor, rich cuts, now on the rugged crests of Ida, now on Ilium's heights. But now, look, brilliant Achilles courses him round the city of Priam in all his savage, lethal speed. Come, you immortals, think this through. Decide. Either we pluck the man from death and save his life, or strike him down at last, here at Achilles' hands, for all his fighting heart. What you want to do, guys? And Athena's like, you're not really thinking about saving him, are you? Come on, this has been the plan all along! If you do save him, you, we will give you no respect. And Zeus is like, nah, I'm just joking, you do what you want to do, Athena, go down and get him. And so, that was the moment Athena was waiting for, and she dives down. And so we return to the run, and they're still sprinting. Hector is in the lead, and Achilles is close behind him. But Hector still is somehow managed to stay ahead of Achilles, even though Achilles is known for his speed. And the book says, how could Hector have fled the fates of death so long? How, unless one last time, one final time, Apollo had swept in close beside him, driving strength in his legs and knees to race the wind. And brilliant Achilles shook his head at the armies, never letting them hurl the sharp spears at Hector. Someone might snatch the glory. Achilles come in second. So Apollo is giving Hector extra bursts of speed just so he can stay ahead of Achilles. And so the race keeps going on, but as they enter into their fourth lap, Zeus stands up and holds his golden scales. 
In it are the souls of Hector and Achilles. And this time the scales tip for Achilles. Hector is doomed to die. And at the moment the scales tip, Apollo holds up his hands and quits, and Athena swoops in. Athena first swoops up beside Achilles and tells him, hey, you can go ahead and rest now. I've got your back here. Together we're going to kill Hector. And so Achilles pauses and, and sits back. And Athena swoops over to Hector. And when she arrives at Hector, she appears not as herself, but as his brother Diphobus. Remember Diphobus back from the fighting with Adominaeus? And when Hector sees him, he's so elated. Here's his brother Diphobus. And he goes, Diphobus, my favorite brother! Not like stupid old Paris who I can't stand. I'm so glad to see you. Technically, he doesn't say that about Paris, but, you know, it's kind of implied. And Athena, disguised as Diphobus, is like, Yeah, I came to your rescue! I dashed out of the gate because I saw you were in trouble. Mom and Dad didn't want me to, but I'm here for you, brother. And so Hector, realizing he's got backup, thinks that he can take Achilles. It's gonna be two on one now. And so Hector turns around, ready to face Achilles, feeling very confident again. Much like he has in the past. He says, no more running from you in fear, Achilles, not as before. Three times I fled round the great city of Priam. I lacked courage then to stand your onslaught. Now my spirit stirs me to meet you face to face. Now kill or be killed. Come, we'll swear to the gods, the highest witness. The gods will oversee our binding packs. I swear I will never mutilate you, merciless as you are, if Zeus allows me to last it out and tear your life away. But once I've stripped your glorious armor, Achilles, I will give your body back to your loyal comrades. Swear you'll do the same. And so he asks for this promise that they will both not mutilate each other's bodies. Now, this is coming at a different moment than when Hector before was ready to turn Patroclus into dog food. Remember that long fight over Patroclus' body? And the other fights that we've seen along the way, like the fight over Sarpedon's body. Hector wants to make sure that they agree at this moment that they're not going to do anything bad to each other's bodies. We've talked about the importance of that in the past. We'll see even more the importance in the next book. But Achilles is having none of it. He is not ready for any kind of concession. He even says, there are no binding oaths between men and lions. I don't even think of you as a person. You're a beast to me. I'm going to slaughter you. Now you're going to pay for the death of Patroclus. I finally got you where I want you. And so Achilles throws his spear. It's a good shot, but Hector's also a good warrior, and he manages to dodge just in time. The spear goes behind him, and it lands on the ground. Now it looks like Achilles is down a spear, but we've got Athena to cheat for him. She immediately snatches up the spear and hands it back to him without Hector seeing. And Hector's feeling really good because he just saw Achilles miss, which definitely betters the odds for him. And he mocks Achilles for missing, and he also says, you'll never hit me in the back, I'm gonna face you head on. And he throws his own spear. And Achilles blocks it with his super awesome shield from Hephaestus. And the spear just bounces away. And so now Hector is down a spear. And he doesn't have a spare. And he also doesn't have a god helping him out to run his spear back to him when he loses it. So he's miffed because he missed the shot. But he thinks that he has backup behind him. Diphobus is supposed to be right behind him. So Hector turns around to ask his brother for his spear. Hey, Diphobus! But in that moment, suddenly, he realizes what's happened. So Hector shouted out to Diphobus, burying his white shield. With a ringing shout, he called for a heavy lance. But the man was nowhere near him vanished. Yes, and Hector knew the truth in his heart. And the fighter cried out, my time has come. At last the gods have called me down to death. I thought he was by my side, the hero Diphobus. He's safe within the walls. Athena's tricked me blind. And now death, grim death, is looming up beside me. No longer far away. No way to escape it now. This this was their pleasure after all. Sealed long ago, Zeus and the son of Zeus, the distant deadly archer. Though often before now they rush to my defense. So now I meet my doom. Well, let me die. But not without struggle, not without glory, no. In some great clash of arms that even men to come will hear of down the years. Man, there's a moment of epiphany right there. He has this moment where suddenly he sees everything. That we've known the whole book. And those moments of pride where he thought that Zeus was totally on his side. 
And Apollo, who backed him up until now, suddenly he realizes that it was all just to get him here so that he could die at Achilles' hands. And he can suddenly see the whole picture. And oh, it hurts, it hurts. But Hector in this moment is going to go down fighting. And he's going to go down fighting so hard that this story will be told for generations to come. Which, yeah, it is. And so he whips out his sword and he runs towards Achilles. And the two of them clash together. And Achilles is protecting himself with his super awesome Hephaestus shield. And Hector is going at him with his wetted sword. And as Achilles looks over Hector, it looks like there is no place in his armor that will let a killing blow through. Because he's wearing the awesome armor that he stole from the body of Patroclus. But Achilles knows this armor well. It's his old armor. And he knows exactly where its weak points are. And as Hector comes at him, Achilles goes right for the neck, that one hole in the armor. And Achilles still has his spear because Athena gave it back to him. And so he slashes Hector through the neck and Hector falls to the ground. And Achilles mocks him saying, when you killed Patroclus, you probably never dreamed that I would come back after you. And Hector, who is bleeding out of his neck, dying, is still able to talk and he begs Achilles to let his body be delivered back to his family. Please, please give my body back to my family. Let them mourn me, let them give me a funeral. They will ransom my body with rich treasure. But Achilles is like, no, no, I am going to let you be chewed apart by dogs and birds. There is nothing they could pay me that would make me give your body back. I am going to do awful things to it. And Hector kind of knew that was going to be the answer, and so he says, I knew you had a heart of iron. And so that the last thing he says is he prophesies Achilles' death. You will die at the Scaean gates. You will be shot down by Apollo's arrow. Apollo and Paris are going to kill you. And so we've had lots of references to that throughout the book, although I think this is the first time we actually get which hero it is that's going to kill Achilles. We always knew that Apollo was going to have a hand in it, but it's going to be Paris who takes him down. That kind of stinks, of all the heroes to take you down. And Achilles taunts his dead body and says, I don't even care. I know I'm going to die. <laughs> That's not news to me. I will accept my death whenever it comes. And so he rips the spear out of Hector's body and then takes his armor off. And then all the Myrmidons, all of Achilles' warriors, come up close and they see their great enemy, Hector, lying on the ground. The one they were all so afraid of. And they're all delighted and they all take turns stabbing his body. And then Achilles is, for a moment, kind of pumped up and ready to go fight the city. But then he says, no, no, no. First, we do Patroclus' funeral. We gotta go back and honor Patroclus. And so then he punches a hole through Hector's ankles and ties a leather strap through it and attaches it to the back of his chariot. That way he can drag Hector face down around the field. And then he whips his chariot back and they head back to the Achaean camp, dragging Hector's body behind them. And so begins the desecration of Hector's body. And Priam and Hecuba, who are still up on the wall, see what's happening to their son. They see the way his body is being treated and they are devastated. There is a grief sequence here that is intense and powerful. It begins with Priam's grief, and Priam tries to throw himself down there to chase after Achilles and beg for his son's body back. All of them have to hold him back and restrain him because he's ready to throw himself into the hands of the Achaeans in order to get Hector's body. And from this point on, Priam's grief is going to be so intense, he's going to basically curse all of his children because the son he loves most is gone. Hecuba's grief is also incredibly intense. Her son was the glory of the city, and without him, it seems like there is no hope at all left. The book then shifts to Andromache, who is back at home, who has not yet heard that her husband is dead. The wife of Hector had not heard a thing. No messenger brought the truth of how her husband made his stand outside the gates. She was weaving at her loom, deep in the high halls, working flowered braiding into a dark red folding robe. She had called her well-kempt woman through the house and set a large three-legged cauldron over the fire so Hector could have his steaming hot bath when he came home from battle. Poor woman. She never dreamed how far he was from bathing, struck down at Achilles' hands by blazing-eyed Athena. But she heard the groans and wails of grief from the rampart now, and her body shook, and her shuttle dropped to the ground, and she called out to her lovely waiting woman, Quickly, 
Two of you follow me. I must see what's happened. That cry, that was Hector's honored mother that I heard. My heart's pounding, leaping up in my throat. The knees beneath me paralyzed. Oh, I know it. Something terrible's coming down on Priam's children. And so we have this sequence where she, she hasn't heard yet and how she's doing all this preparation for Hector to come home for her. And the dramatic irony of that moment is painful. And when she hears Hecuba's voice, she begins to suspect. She doesn't want to go straight to the idea that her husband is dead. But she becomes more and more afraid as she runs out. And as she arrives at the top of the wall, she sees what's happened. She sees her husband's body being dragged by Achilles. And in that moment, she faints and falls backwards. And it describes how this coronet and veil that were given to her by Aphrodite on her wedding fall off of her head. And as the women revive her, then she begins her grief speech. She starts with the recognition that both her and her husband seemed doomed by fate, just as her whole early life was punctuated by the death of her whole family. Now her husband has also been destroyed. But she spends most of her grief in the speech about their son, this child who, now that he is fatherless, we remember back to book six when we saw Hector with his son. Now that this child will no longer have a father, even if he survives the war, his future looks very bleak. He will be an orphan, when he used to be called by the city Astanax, or Lord of the City, because his father was the city's protector. Now without his father to protect the city, he also no longer has his own protection, and he will be alone and friendless. And she ends her speech by talking about how she doesn't even have his body to grieve over. And so she decides to burn all of his clothes since she cannot burn his body in a funeral. And so ends the climax of the book. We still have two books left to go to resolve things. Okay, let's look at the key features of this section. There is, of course, as always, some great epic similes, especially as Hector and Achilles are running around Troy. I read one earlier about a hawk that's swooping after a dove. There's also some excellent symmetry in this book. The beginning with the pleas of Priam and Hecuba on the wall as they're begging their son to come inside are mirrored by the grief speeches at the end. There are also a lot of great contrasts in here. We have Achilles who has known his fate for this entire book. He's felt the weight of his fate in every moment and every decision that he makes. He knows he's going to die and he knows how. And so when his end is prophesied, you know, he's just like, I don't care. I know, I know, I got it. My talking horse even told me. But Hector has been blinded by his arrogance. He's been blinded by the support that Zeus has given him. And so he has this moment of revelation where the blindness is wiped away from his eyes and he can suddenly see the whole plot what we've been seeing this whole time, and that moment is just so potent. There is, of course, the powerful exploration of the tragedy and cruelty of war. War is ugly and devastating for everyone. And we see that very, very clearly in the speech of King Priam, but also just in the general idea. Nobody wins here. Yeah, Achilles finally gets to kill Hector, but Achilles has already lost. He played a risky game in order to win big glory, and yeah, he wins glory by beating Hector, but it's not what he desired. He's lost Patroclus in the process. Finally, there is the symbol of the golden scales. We've seen that a couple of times in the book. Zeus weighing out the fates of men. Who is going to live and who is going to die. And it's a pretty cool image. We will continue next time with the funeral of Patroclus. Thanks for watching. You can click to subscribe or watch another video, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.